A look at our ancestry, an astrological irony, an introduction to Abraham, and an attack on our Savior. All of this today on 3 and 1 as we look at Genesis chapters 10 through 12 and Matthew chapter 4. Well, the waters receded, with new mountains high and new valleys low, and eight exited the ark to find a new normal. Everything had changed, even the atmosphere. And according to God's plan, these eight began to repopulate the earth, living their lives, working the land, having sons, having daughters. And so in the passing of time, the population on the earth grew and particular people groups began to form as some settled in certain geographic locations. And in Genesis chapter 10, we get a look back at the founders, the original ancestors of many of the people groups that we know today. Our ancestry, our ancestors. Did you know that we are all sons or daughters of Noah? Isn't that interesting? He is our great, great, plus 198 great grandpa. There was quite the bottleneck in the gene pool as the waters of the flood fell upon the earth and only eight were saved. But then, as we said, sons and daughters had sons and daughters who had sons and daughters and so on. And some of these sons and daughters, the original ancestors of particular people groups are listed for us in Genesis chapter 10. Now, much better men than me have traced the ancestry of each of these names with a fair amount of certainty. And so consider, first we start with Noah. He had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem was the ancestor to the Persians and the Assyrians. Ham was the ancestor to the Africans and the Babylonians. Then there was Japheth, who we encountered first in this genealogy. Japheth had Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshech and Tiras. Now, check this out. Listen, Gomer was the ancestor to the Germanic people including the first French, Spanish, and Celtic settlers. Then there's Magog and Tubal and Meshech. These were the original ancestors of the Northern Europeans and the Russian peoples. Then there was Madai, ancestor to the Medes, which is now Iran and Iraq, and ancestor also to the Indian people. And then Javan, original ancestor of the ancient Greeks. Now, there are so many more specifics that we do not have time to explore today, but suffice to say, Genesis chapter 10 contains a remarkably accurate table of nations for a post-flood world. The Bible, the only truly accurate source for finding out our origins, where we came from, who we truly are, and where we are going. Now, we are not that many generations away from the flood as we enter into Genesis chapter 11. And as you remember from your reading, there was a futile attempt on man's part to reach heaven on their own, an astrological irony. The astrological part is easy to see. They, they built a tower to reach the sky or as a part of cultic worship to see the sky. The irony part is a little bit more difficult to see, but like we said, civilization seems to be man's attempt to live lives free from the dependency that we need to have upon God, which in reality is rebellion against God. It is the way of Cain. Cain said, oh, you cursed the ground, huh, God? Well, I'll show you. I'll show you what I can do with my own strength, with my own hands. Now, in Genesis chapter 11, their reaction, their rebellion was not against the fall like Cain. Their reaction, their rebellion was against the flood. Did you see what kind of materials they used as they constructed their astrological tower. They made it waterproof. They used asphalt, otherwise known as pitch, the same material used to waterproof the basket that carried baby Moses down the Nile. Now here's the ironic part. Their reaction, their rebellion was against the flood. They made their tower waterproof when God had already promised to never again destroy the earth with a flood. But, like we said, he didn't say anything about a fire. They may have made their tower waterproof, but they certainly did not make it fireproof. In fact, their best attempt at reaching up to heaven on their own was as flammable as possible. It was a huge furnace of irony, an awful irony. Man 
cannot reach heaven on their own. So, in his mercy, God scattered their attempt to build a flammable sandcastle and sent them with new languages to their separate corners. All a part of the grand plan to let life be futile and frustrating apart from a full, complete, unhindered relationship with God. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 8, verses 20 and 21. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. So, praise God that he mercifully smashes our sandcastles again and again and again. Well, as this slightly embarrassing episode of Finding Your Roots continues, we are finally introduced to a man commonly called the father of the faith, a man named Abraham. But that was not his name at first, was it? His name at first was Abram. Now, we'll talk about the name change when we reach Genesis chapter 17, which at our pace will be Monday of next week. This has been so great going through the Word of God with you, especially at this pace. We are 12 chapters into the old and four chapters into the new after only four days. And it hasn't seemed like a whole lot since we are only reading three from the old and one from the new each day. So good. So, Abram. We're introduced to him at the end of chapter 11. And in the beginning of chapter 12, we really start to see the plan of God unfold for his life. God speaks to Abram and invites him, or rather commands him to take a venture of faith. Abram, leave your family, your father's house, and go to a land that I will show you. For I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, in order for this to happen, it will have to be the miraculous hand of God since Sarai was barren and the two of them were advanced in age. But first, before any of that could happen, Abraham would have to find the faith to obey God and leave his family, to leave his father's house, which he did without even knowing where he was going. God said, get up and go to a land that I will show you. Now, isn't that often how the Lord works? He wants to see that we are willing, that we trust him, that we have faith in him. And then after we begin to move, he gives us further instructions. So Abram, demonstrating great faith and trust in God, the father of faith, as we commonly call him. But before we start to put him on a pedestal, remember, every man and every woman has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, even the father of faith, even Abram, even Abraham, as we'll call him on Monday of next week. As Genesis chapter 12 concludes, there is quite the comical interaction as they enter into Egypt. Apparently, Sarai was quite the looker extremely attractive and also approaching 70 years of age. Attractive enough for Abram to be worried about being killed as her husband. So another man could try and take her. So the father of faith came up with a plan that demonstrated his lack of faith, that demonstrated his humanity. He had Sarai say that she was his sister. He had Sarai lie rather than simply trust God and tell the truth. Fortunately, God was gracious, and they were able to exit Egypt unharmed. Embarrassed, yes, but unharmed. Now, as much as that was an illustration of what faithlessness looks like, as we now transition into our New Testament reading, we are going to see a demonstration of faithfulness. After Jesus was baptized and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove, that same Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness for a time of testing. Satan seized the opportunity to take a time of testing and turn it into a time of temptation. At the most opportune time for him, Satan attacked Jesus at his physically weakest. Now, although he was physically weak, he was spiritually strong. He was full of the Holy Spirit. Thin, gaunt, muscle, and sinew, but full of wide-eyed wonder as the power of the Holy Spirit coursed through his veins. Answering every attack with the Word of God, our greatest offensive and defensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit. 
Jesus was tempted with the lust of the flesh, and he answered the attack with, It is written. He answered the attack with, The word of God. Jesus was tempted with the lust of the eyes. He answered the attack with, It is written. He answered the attack with, The word of God. Jesus was tempted with the pride of life, and he answered the attack with, It is written. He answered the attack with, The word of God. Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, yet he was victorious, untainted by sin. A great model for us to follow, a great man for us to follow, as we learn how to fight by faith. Son of man, son of God, Jesus Christ. We're following after him. Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, who at the end of Matthew chapter 4 chose to begin his ministry in Galilee giving opportunity for others to follow him, to learn from him, to learn of him, to learn to fight by faith. To fight by faith, yes, but also, and most importantly, to find rest for their souls. So who did he start with? Did he start with theologians? Did he start with professors? Did he start with professionals? No, he started with some sailors, just some fishermen, some fishermen from Galilee that would soon learn to be fishers of men. He said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. And oh, how I am looking forward to seeing their lives unfold as they follow Jesus. Seeing their lives unfold once again as we work our way through the word. As they follow him, as they learn from him, and as he finally sends them and fills them with his Holy Spirit. See, the same is happening today. Make no mistake, the same is happening today with you. You are following the same Jesus. You are learning from the same Jesus. The same Jesus is teaching you and sending you and filling you with his Holy Spirit. You are following Jesus, aren't you? He's calling you. He's calling you to come to him. He's calling you to follow him. Will you answer? The grandest adventure awaits if you will only answer his call. Come to him. Follow him today.